Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome all back to ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture here from uh, Honolulu, our capital in our sometimes in peril paradise. And recently it's uh, full forces of nature. Um, hurricanes, we're approaching Olivia, uh, which is on the edge of being a hurricane, but our folks on the East Coast heading the Carolinas is way more severe. That's Florence, uh, category five hurricanes. So I have my uh, recent uh, guest on the show, Chris Ford, uh, who is heading there mourning the death of his father. So, uh, uh, Chris, please stay safe out there. And since uh, this show on this Tuesday falls on 9-11, uh, we cannot not remember what has happened 17 years ago, which is an event uh, where more human forces were involved, and that's the attack on the World Trade Center in New York City. So this being an architectural show and about Hawaii, I was sort of struggling to find the right way to deal with that. And slide number one, please, up. Um, I went to our most commercial bookstore, which is Ella Moana, and I'm sorry to say we have lost our architectural chapter and we got merged with arts and photography. And at the very bottom left, you see what is left. And one of the books was one um, World Trade Center, which is the re not exactly the replacement building because the two footprints got left and made into a memorial, but the, the tower next over, which you see at the top left. But uh, many, including me, think that this tower doesn't have um, the same level of innovation which the original one had. So I don't want to talk about that one. And I found something that gets close, I think very close, because the architect Minoru Yamazaki built um, uh, two buildings on the island and one actually shortly before the World Trade Centers, which were built in 70 and 72. So we're talking about a building he built in 68 and I was looking for the uh, most uh, appropriate post-occupancy evaluator and I found him in our most uh, emerging, ambitiously emerging uh, practitioner, uh, Joey Valenti. And so Joey, um, welcome on the show and you are remotely on the show because um, uh, you're known at ThinkTech Hawaii and some of the shows are featured here on the top right through your Albizia project and you're currently traveling on that related wood innovation grant uh, around the islands and you're chasing or the hurricane is chasing you and you're trying to get your way out. So thank you for taking your time actually currently at when the audience hears wind. This is in the windy, easy breezy uh, Kona airport on the big island. So welcome, Joey. Thank you, Martin. Yep, and I'll, uh, I'll try to block the wind as best I can. Thank you very much. And, and so, um, again, uh, an update on, on your project will happen probably with my fellow hosts at the Head Start of that thing. And we want to talk about, and I collage this in a way that I'm saying uh, maybe this building or this part of the building in the middle of that page here might have been an inspiration for, for that building. And let's go to the next slide and basically check out um, I, I'm almost to say, you know, this is where you currently are. This is somewhere out in the woods. But where is this exactly, Joey? So this is actually on the third floor um, Lanai space for 1350 Alamoana. So the above the parking garage uh, podium. Mm -hmm. And it's a, uh, it's a very nicely laid out. Uh, public space for residents um, with a s swimming pool, uh, barbecue amenities, fitness center. Yeah, and I made a reference to the recent show with the Soto Brown, which we called Re-Archineering. So this is sort of in the interface between architecture and landscapes. Slate number two shows what you just explained. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that is basically the pool. It's kind of camouflaged behind the sort of circular hedge. Next slide, number four, is nice walkways meandering through this very sort of jungly landscape. And, you know, the architecture almost sort of being an integral part. And next picture, number five, is is an outdoor uh, gathering space, right, in the building and in the park, under the building, I should say. Uh -huh. So, uh, but the, the way to actually get into the building is the next slide here. Uh, and I, 
this is approaching, you already said, the name of the building is simply its postal address. That's very understated, very humble. It doesn't have a fancy Hawaiianized name or how they do it today, a themed name. This is very simply dry cut, typical for the sort of understated mid-century, just naming it with a number um, of the building. So 1315 Alamoana Boulevard. And by the time I was checking out the building, this sort of um, vintage bug was parked in front of the building. So I thought this is a nice pair of two vintage, you know, um, sort of um, symbols of their time uh, matching, matching each other. So let's go into the building and next slide. Where are we there, Joey? This is the, the lobby, the front lobby entrance as you walk into the building. Mm -hmm. And as, as you can and see here, right, it's what kind of features do you see and you guys are proud of? Uh, I think a key feature that, that speaks throughout the, the design is the natural ventilation. Mm -hmm. So you can see the louvered, um, the louvered system above the entryway, the two entry and exit doors. Um, yeah, let's turn around, uh, sort of 45 degrees. Next picture. This is looking into the lobby. Uh, reminds me very much of these glorious American days of mid-century. This reminds me of um, the Emico or Standard Oil building in Chicago. Uh, Edward Durrell Stone, which we have a building on campus by Stone that we will do the next show about. And so this is very sort of classy yet understated. It's not to try to bling and overdo it like in the lobbies of these days. It's, it's very subtle and humble and elegant, but yet uh, very impressive, I have to say. Right. And, and this is, uh, we have known each other before from working at school together, but when I was checking out the building on my own, I got as far as the doorman, the security guy, and he was suspicious of this guy checking out the building maybe even before, because of the tragic background of Yamazaki buildings having been become victims of attacks. So, uh, and, and you saved me and helped me out because you were coming out with your partner and, and okaying that and say, this guy is okay, you, send, you can let him roam. And actually all the pictures um, we're seeing here, I was able to take uh, thanks to you. <laughs> so um, yeah. let's check out the building. Let's go up the elevator here, next picture. And, and see we're here on a, on a typical floor plan. And I pulled this from the, the website from a realtor, including the text. And it's almost like they feel a little bad when they say this is a more traditional design building compared to its super luxury neighbors. And we want to point out in the show that that's nothing to be ashamed of. That's, that's something to be proud of. I put in the north era, which is very important to fully appreciate and understand the building. As we can see, it's a double loaded corridor, so it isn't the ideal with the single loaded corridors that we love the most, but it's open to the uh, Malka end of the hallway. And you know, this picture I took of that little feature with a, where the floor plan is, is narrowing, it's sort of echoing some of the details on the exterior that we're gonna get to in a little bit. And why don't you uh, walk us through a, a sort of a, um, a typical unit, and with that, let's go to the next slide, slide number 10. Okay, so that last image you saw was the third floor, I believe, as you would walk out. And there are units on that on that bottom level, but it takes you out to that grass and eye that you had showed earlier. Mm -hmm. And then what you're seeing in the following image is a typical, um, looks like unrenovated unit. So it has the original uh, kitchen, which is a, a semi-enclosed space. And my, my unit actually, uh, when we moved in, was already partially renovated, so that, that uh, kitchen has been opened up, mm -hmm. and we have a peninsula. So definitely a different, um, different experience once you change some things in the wall. Mm -hmm. but, um, and speaking of experience, if we turn around now 180 degrees, we're looking inside out. Next picture, please. Uh-huh. And, so and now that, that takes you mm -hmm. to, yep, to the outside lanai. Each unit is um, equipped with a lanai space that has, a, I think, uh, 100 and something square feet of exterior space. Mm -hmm. 
And that seems very much like an outdoor living room, like a perfect lanai. And next picture, number 12, sort of shows uh, that this element is sort of does multiple things at the same time. The sort of convexing out allows you to, to stand at its most, you know, outside and it's almost like you're flying. But then this sort of um, uh, concaving in towards your neighbor's uh, dividing slab avoids that you can actually sort of peek around into your neighbor's unit. So it's very cleverly designed and it also gives this sort of very recti rectangularity of the building a, a pep and a spice of, of, or, of sexy curves, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's go back in, uh, next slide, and explain a little bit sort of the, the, the extended layout of the, of the units. So this looks like a, a slight renovation to a unit where they've opened up that space between one of the bedrooms mm -hmm. and the, the living space. And then if you look at that open door on the left, that was where we were standing in the previous image of mm -hmm. the outside lanai. So you have this open living floor plan that's adjacent to the kitchen. And then in this specific unit, you have a partition kind of opening that has allowed a much larger space between the unit and the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And we have to say, although we see that nasty machine out on the lanai, which is sort of not supposed to be there, which is a single you know, AC unit, but they were actually designed to be work without AC. We're talking 1968, and so AC wasn't as uh, dominant and predominant yet, and it, the building was designed in a way to actually naturally ventilate itself, sort of by climatically air conditioning itself. And you told me that, you know, it, for sure the original owners, uh, you know, many of them uh, have always been doing that, are still doing it, and we're hoping that through the show we can encourage more to do it because that's sort of a USP, something specific that all these new towers, they're designed in a way you can't do this anymore, right? So that is not a disadvantage in the sort of re uh, sort of um, appreciation of natural ventilation and of bioclimatic design. This might be a classic uh, to that degree. And I want to point out this, what you explained to the right. It's a very clever setup because you see this sort of a uh, set of two windows and then you see this closet and you know this is something you would never find in modern buildings where it's all about the view which is a little absurd because the more you know buildings you build the less view you have but they always go about the view so they end up being nothing but glass and you get blasted and here he puts a closet uh, you know towards the view and and why did he do that uh, so the closet actually is creating these um we could jump to the next mm -hmm. next image yeah um you can actually see the vertical fins that are creating a um, uh, shading device for the uh, east and west um, side of the building exactly thank so, you for teaching us uh bioclimatic design 101 Buildings uh -huh. facing east and west, uh, the shading device has to be vertical versus if you're facing south, it has to be horizontal and north, you don't need anything. And that building is demonstrating that pretty cleverly here. And since it's south, uh, east and northwest, you need a little bit of both. And so these horizontal overhangs do a little bit at certain times of the day and mainly and majorly the vertical ones. So zooming out, next picture again. Hopefully now uh, people watching the show uh, look at the building differently. This isn't just a formalist approach. This is a performalist approach. And um, so the architecture has a bioclimatic genetic code that is basically making up an experience. And, and I allow myself, again, with your project going on, you're going along the same line, so maybe intuitively or consciously, you, you know, you grew up in the, I mean, you have been in the building, so you've been a resident, so you, probably the genetic code was sort of seeping into your system and, um, and yes. you, you, you living it. And jump to the next picture, um, which is another bioclimatic aspect of the building that is doing really well. Okay, are we on we're, we're on 16? 16, exactly. Okay, and 
We are now looking at the See. Well, we're, we're looking at the entirety of the building, and I put in the, the north arrow again because I wanted to point out the macro aspect of climate, right? Uh huh. So and this the entire this, building. This building is, is running Maoka Makai, so it is not yes. blocking the predominant winds that are created that way and, and go that way. <laughs> Which, unfortunately, uh, reference to other shows here on the on the bottom right, the symphony at the top, which is becomes a microwave, and then the new affordable tower on Kapiolani Boulevard, they both violate that very important uh, simple rule of buildings having to run Malcolm Mackay, so you don't block the urban fabric. And when everyone bits, puts their building blocking the wind, you don't get any wind anymore. So. These early masters, because they're bioclimatic masters, they, they just knew that. And, and obviously then, sure. with the, through the introduction of oil, uh, we uh, afforded ourselves to basically unlearn that, which is sort of um, uh, unfortunate. So let's uh, move on to the next slide, um, because um, this building is also a product of something we're returning to, because I know that you're working with a great team of multiple disciplines and so you're sort of undoing this sort of pretty fatal uh, development of architects to architecture where the architect is the mastermind and the other ones are minions and here one of the creators of the building was uh, a, a legendary engineer dr alfred yi and we had him at docomomo give a talk story i had to miss that unfortunately because i was in germany over the time so the next uh, slide please i had the chance to meet him uh, once before he then passed away not that long ago and he was involved in in all these marvels you see East West Center IBM building um, Kahala Hilton Arizona Memorial Frank Fazi building you name them all and you see another one at the very top that we want to point out this is his other project which you want to point out at the very end so next picture is uh, I got uh, 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 an appointment with Alfred Yi and he was looking at a building uh, that we're doing in my tree texture class, uh, Primitiva 1, uh, and next uh, picture, is again extending that sort of team building, um, basically integrated project delivery, we call that in the discipline. And we have a, n a bunch of gentlemen here, Howard Wig, my host fellow, Socrates Paratakos from the Honolulu Fire Department, and uh, Scott Wilson, AIA. And we get Les Campers on the right side. And let's jump to Les because he, next picture, um, here we are, and uh, an, an inherent sort of uh, inspiration for the building are his twin tees um, that we're using, and so um, and so was Alamoana Boulevard. These 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 closet boxes pretty much had been uh, prefabricated elements that had been craned in, so they were pouring the floor slabs and then craning in these. So very innovative, also uh, in its making uh, of of its architecture. And uh, next. Picture is you can see uh, our design a tribute or an evolution of uh, 1315 Alamoana Boulevard by a climatic easy breezy, obviously pushing it to an even more extreme level. And next picture uh, that they would appear almost like more than uh, natural organisms in the landscape here, polemically placed on the Alamoana Mall, could be the proletarian people power tower hosting all the low paid uh, service people who are working in the mall and they don't have to you know, uh, truck themselves out to the west and, and drive back in. They can stay where they basically are. So let's keep on driving Alamolana Boulevard going west in the next picture. And that shows us how you approach the building now these days. This is the more recent um, development next to it that used to be um, the Sears in an open parking lot for uh, for decades. And recently, uh, McNaughton and Kobayashi Group uh, built this high-end residential a development and um, moving on to the next picture is driving by uh, passing the building and looking back and you see uh, something that they currently do to the building what is that Joey so they're, they're it's undergoing renovation on the exterior and, um, you can see the stripes they've actually begun painting but um, the initial work they did was uh, spalling repair mm -hmm. on the um, individual lanais and then um, repainting the entire unit. So they're currently in the last phase of this, I think, over the next several months. Um, before I go any further, I, I was tapped on the last question, so I got a little distracted, but I have 
that was my five minute mark. I have maybe one or two minutes left to to kind of wrap up before I head into the to the airport. So all right. Well, thanks for staying with us for so long, especially yeah. under these circumstances here. So I appreciate it. So you said um, the justification for the color within the and, and so the building board association is was what? Uh, they had. It was mentioned. I asked um, the the GM, and it actually was, um, as I was told, the original uh, design of the building. But I, I, I'm not sure on where that information was. So yeah, and this as, is, um, as being private investigators, probably the second to last question when you had to go through security. <laughs> I can maybe give a little clue about that. But we were saying before uh -huh. the show, doesn't really matter because you know color is like makeup, and you can take makeup off and put it on back on. And and yellow seems to be the color of these days because the neighboring building on this side next to the round one has yellow on it and. Also, the new uh, Kobayashi McNaughton has yellow, so probably they thought everyone wears yellow, so we got to wear yellow too, <laughs> right? But we were saying yeah. maybe in the original days it was just beton bleu because these were the times, and you can sandblast that off and clear coat it at any time. But we were saying, right. you know, what, what we appreciate is that uh, versus that previous sort of beige washing all over the building, uh, leaving the floor slab sort of beige and only making sort of these infill boxes, which are actually the closet boxes, is, is actually sort of making this sort of tectonic element of, of plugging in more, more visible. So we want to, you know, give them, give them that. Um, Appreciate that. Okay. Um, the next slide is, um, again, from Alamona Beach Park looking, and you see it, you know, amongst these pretty hideously hermetic big monsters, that are doing everything different uh, than Alamoana Boulevard uh, basically does it. So it's, you know, we want to encourage people to see it as a really sort of well-aged, very sexy, mid-aged uh, mid lady that is, is looking, you know, as good as she always did all these years. And the next picture is, um, is two of our previous guests here, um, Tropical Tourism uh, guest Suzanne and Tropical Tutoring expert Bill, having dinner at one of the Nordstrom restaurants and, and facing Alamoana Boulevard. This side hasn't been completed in painting. And, and there you go. It's, it's this sort of very classy mid-century building that no one has to feel ashamed of. In fact, when you learn about the building, you think that is actually the coolest building, and we obviously, people who know us, we don't mean this literally, but also figuratively. And uh, so we, we hope people sort of appreciate or reappreciate the building today as much as they have in the past, because um, the next and second to last page, which we already promised, um, is having, uh, there's an event because Hawaii 5.0 turns half a century, and the um, celebration was supposed to be uh, at the end of uh, this week, but it's got canceled due to Olivia as your original itinerary, uh, sort of hopping the island in the mission of your wood innovation had to be rearranged. So you're on your way back because you were supposed to be in Maui, and Maui is unfortunately most likely going to be hit the hardest. So everything has to be rescheduled. Okay. But again, thanks for having been with us. But this picture here shows, this is one of the early episodes of the original Hawaii 5.0. And you can see, you know, as we pointed out in the show about uh, architects, uh, our, uh, our Hawaii 5.0, that architecture of this pioneering era wasn't just generic background like in the, in the current one. Oh, now we hear the winds blow. Hopefully you're still uh, on the ground and not flying away. And, and so again, they were very uh, proudly basically celebrating that building that they thought of being very innovative and, and, and unique and, and pioneering. And so again, we just want to keep that in mind. And by having understood the building, thanks to your explaining it to us, I think we're going to appreciate the building any more, uh, even more. Uh, that gets us to the end of the show. The last uh, picture here is, is again, um, we have uh, not only one building, but we actually have two buildings by this very famous to be memorized today because of the special event um, architect. And the other one is at the very bottom left. I inserted that into the Time Magazine cover that he got way back. And this is Queen Emma Gardens. And Queen Emma Gardens is uh, 
a little bit different. It was built four years earlier than this one here in 64. And it also had a little bit more of a social approach. And with that, it's probably even more an inspiration for your project that you're doing and what we're doing. So we're going to talk about that. But we also wish um, especially our houseless neighbors and fellows on the island to uh, basically stay especially safe and sound in these uh, you know, hours and days of, of uh, nature's full forces. So, Joey, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Have safe travels. Excellent. Thanks so much, Martin. I appreciate you having me. All right. So thank you, Joey. All right. So uh, see you next week for another episode of Human Human Architecture with DeSoto Brown. It's going to be called uh, The Built Rainbow, uh, Superficiality and Surface of the Architecture of UH Manoa. So be excited about that one. And until then, please uh, stay as sexy as 1315 Alamona Boulevard and safe and sound. Bye-bye.